what is the goal of all Christian instruction? Worship. Worship, That's right. So grab some groups, whatever groups you want. um, And you guys will spend some time just chatting about how have you seen God's goodness this week? So just however you want to split up in your groups. Um, All right. Right back into your groups. Tonight, the big part of tonight is going to be talking about overseers and deacons. And then there's like a little rap because Paul likes to break out and rap. So, um, a poem. Uh, so I want you all to hop back into your groups and I want you to talk about what sort of church structure have you been under in your life? You know, what does it look like? Have you had elders, deacons, you know, women, men, whatever. Um, and what offices have your church had? And, you know, whatever you've been under and did you understand why? They did what they did. All right, so take a beat. I'm actually. All right, I'm gonna pull y'all back. I'm gonna pull y'all back. Uh, how many of y'all prior to St. Jude had a female pastor at any point? How many of y'all prior to St. Jude had a female pastor? You had a female pastor? You've had female pastors? Uh, anybody had a female elder? Sort of. Sort of. Okay. That's usually what we say about most women in ministry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Julie was one. Uh, how many of y'all had a high liturgy? You had a bishop, you had elders, you had deacons. Yeah. Uh, anybody had like a real flat church where there was like, a, it's more congregational, where the congregation had a vote all the time, anytime? Anybody? Mario? Yeah. Um, did not work out very well. Did not work out very well. That, yeah. Ah, uh, that happens. Um, it's interesting, like, St. Jude uh, in our bylaws, if any of y'all have ever read them, we actually made it very easy to oust Martin and I. Um, you just need, like, what was it, like, 10% of the vote of whoever shows up or something? I don't know. But we basically wanted to make it to where, like, if in the event one of us, like, went off the rails, it, power was back with you all. Because um, we have so much, we wield so much power and influence. And so I don't remember exactly how it works, but I remember... I remember Diane did the math real quick and was like, so like 12 people currently could re- remove you from your post. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay. Um, you know, that, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But um, okay, today we're gonna, I'm going to read the verses to you. This is kind of a, a really brief sketch of it. Um, and as we jump in, how you guys just basically said, we've kind of been under different leadership. That's actually in concert quite a bit. With the New Testament, but what's interesting, almost everywhere you go, they'll tell you that's the way the New Testament was run, which they're all lying when they say that. So we're going to read uh, 1 Timothy 3. They're not lying. They're just not being truthful. They're wrong. However I want to say that, they're wrong. Um, second and third century is different, but first century, very, very, very different bag there. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 3. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy, and he must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. And furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace in the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives or women, depending on how that's translated, likewise should be worthy of respect, not slander, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And then Paul likes to break out into rap. So, I write these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. But if I should be delayed, I've written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. And most certainly, the mystery of godliness is great. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the Gentiles slash nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Paul just likes to break out and rap. So this is what we're going to be looking at. The first seven verses are qualifications for overseers, then qualifications for deacons, and I will argue deaconesses, uh, and then 14 through 16, the mystery of godliness. So just a reminder... 
Paul is writing to Timothy about serving the church, maybe churches of Ephesus. So we have um, evidence that in a re- like Paul would write to a region, and there's evidence that that region would have multiple churches. That is booming tonight, isn't it? Um, are we good? Can y'all hear me? Okay. I'll just get louder. Uh, so, for example, Rome would almost most li- like, there's, people will always estimate, but most likely multiple churches in Rome. So the letters that he would write to those regions would get passed around, and people would read them in that place. So Paul's writing to Timothy about how to minister in an area where there's rampant Artemis worship taking place. And so he believes, Paul believes, look, you have this issue of rampant Artemis worship. You have issues that we already have from the letter to Ephesus where there's division, um, where there's hostility within the family groups. There's hostility between slaves and masters. Um, there's, there's just issues in Ephesus. And so Paul, having already sent Timothy, believes having good leadership within those congregations will help them to avoid the false teaching and grow in maturity. This is wisdom, Right. So when people are like, we don't need leaders. I'm like, you, you always need leaders. Has anybody ever done well in a movement with absolutely no leaders? Now, bad leaders, not good. And I understand the response to that. When people are like, we're a true egalitarian movement. That's what's so great about Christianity. Everyone was on equal footing. I'm like, no, they weren't. Um, and so we see within the New Testament, there are people called out to do a work and care specifically for that body that's meeting in their home. Okay? So a couple of notes. There is no, this is all caps for a reason, there is no definitive New Testament structure for the church in the first century, period. You, you're not going to find it. Um, and in fact, there's, I, had to, I did a whole semester on this in grad school, and at the end of it, they're like, so how would you structure your church? And, and so you kind of think about it, and then he's like, how would Paul structure your church? And the answer we always end up coming back to is whatever was best for that local congregation. Whatever would have worked best for them. Do y'all remember, for those of you who were in class, where we talked about the early church, where I talked about voluntary associations? Okay. For those of you who weren't, do y'all remember the Flintstones and the water buffalo? The what? Yeah. That's a voluntary association. The voluntary association is a group. So everything in the ancient world worked on honor. If you were rich and you had a good name and you had status, you didn't need that. If you were the middle guy, low man on the totem pole, chances are you belonged to a voluntary association. It usually had to do with how you worked. Some of them were just burial associations. They were just guys that got together, drank a lot of wine, had women over for bad things, and then just agreed, when you die, we'll bury you, because burial is a big deal in the ancient world. Okay, So they're just like clubs where people would hang out. Remember, there's no Netflix. There's no pickleball. right? So they have to find ways to spend their time. The voluntary association uses the same language for leadership that much of the church does. Part of the reason why there's, there is that coming together of those two things is because they're both using family language. So some scholars say, okay, well, the voluntary association used the family language first, and the church is borrowing completely from that. Or family is just everything in the ancient world, so it makes sense that you would name things based on what you understand. That's most likely what's happening. But chances are Paul did borrow from the voluntary associations in these pagan cities because they're going to already understand what an overseer is. They're going to already understand what a deacon is. They're going to already understand what a pater familias is, the head of the family household. Um, and so there, he relies heavily on this family language. This overseer role was often the head of the household of wherever the house met. That's who the overseer became. He's already an overseer, which is even why he says, hey, depending on how he runs his household, we'll tell you how good of an overseer he's going to be. So in a few weeks, we're going to talk about widows as an office, not a station in life. And we're going to notice some of the same qualifications for overseers are going to be in that list for widows. It's very interesting. Um, and so again, these, these words may not mean exact, like father is metaphorical, and widow might mean that as well. Some of the evidence for it is you go to ancient, um, where do we bury people? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, those places. And uh, spent a lot of time there. Um, Tis the season, spooky season. And they would have, uh, you'll see headstones that would say, Linnell, the wife of Mario. And then they would have Nika, I'm sorry, Linnell, the widow of Mario. And then they would have Nika, the widow of St. Jude. And they'd be going, that's interesting. Why is my husband not mentioned? And they think some of that might be because she became better known as the leader, the female leader over whatever church family she was a part of. And was supported by the church, and then her wisdom was used in those settings.
The overseer, like I said, is most likely the paterfamilias of the home where the church gathered. And so he would naturally already have leadership and power. So these qualifications are also to make sure that he's good. So this person you're meeting in their home, and chances are, you know, that he might have a way that he runs his house. And he becomes a Christian. And Paul's saying, just because you are the head of a family and you're wealthy doesn't mean you should be the head of the church. And so Paul's trying to make sure of this. Um, okay. We'll keep going, and then I'll, we'll get to those discussion questions. Um, every church had an overseer, but not necessarily an elder. And we'll talk about elders in the next week. Elders were used when more than one church was in a city, and they needed to gather and make decisions for the whole region. So every church had an overseer who was over that, but then when they would gather together, they would have then elders that would do that. All of this changes in the second century. But we often import later categories back into the Bible. And so we're going to try and take these categories for what they are um, as it's being delivered to us. So anyways, every church has an overseer, but not necessarily an elder. And we'll talk later about elder. Elder in the first century is really just an older man. That's, that's really all it means. Is like, and you're going to see when we talk about him, he has to rebuke the elder men because they're drunkards. And Paul's like, do, do it gently. So the overseer would have real authority and it has these qualifications. And so we'll talk about what these qualifications are. So what I read to you, above reproach, most scholars think like that's kind of a headline. This is really what we're looking for. Somebody that you just can't bring a charge against them all the time. You know Jimmy got in a bar fight again. You know Jimmy's siphoning money out. You, like, no, he needs to be somebody who's like, no, he's above reproach. And then what follows are all these qualifiers. Now, Scott McKnight says we shouldn't view this as a checklist. But really, we should view this as more of a description of what a faithful person looks like, which is why Scott has no problem with women being elders. I mean, well, later, so this is where it gets tricky. Overseer tends to end up being what we call elders today. But they're different terms in the New Testament, so even that gets confusing. We change the names. But this is why he doesn't have a problem having women at any level of leadership within the church. Because he's like, this isn't men. It's like, hey, look for a person who has these characteristics. But since the churches would be meeting in homes, the head of the household would be a man. And so he's like, most likely all the overseers were men. But he gives the but he says, but maybe not in Philippi, where it was meeting in Lydia's home. So she'd be the pater, no, she'd be the mater familias of that home. And so there's a very good chance they saw her as the overseer. And so these qualifications above reproach says husband of one wife. How many of y'all have been told you can't be divorced and be an elder because of this? Okay, so first of all, you can't be a overseer. So this is also going back to why we should get the words correct. There are basically these big ideas of what they think is happening. One, they say this means you can't be a polygamist. There are no polygamists in Greco-Roman culture for the most part. Um, you might have a woman who's dependent upon you, but you're not legally marrying her. Um, that's pretty much gone by the time the Roman society comes along. You're also not married for love and all that either, so it's, it's very different. Uh, they say, no, you, can, you can't be a widow and then get remarried. And they say, well, that's crazy because people did that all the time. That can't be what he's talking about. You can't be celibate. You have to be married. So you can't be a single guy. You have to be married because you have to show that you know how to be a good husband in order for you to leave the church. Uh, Jesus would be the one I would go back to over and over again. Yeah, Timothy is another great example, though we have no evidence that he has a wife. We have no evidence Paul had a wife. Probably not what he's talking about. Most people then say you can't be remarried and re, uh, remarried after you've been divorced. But Matthew 19.9 and 1 Corinthians 7.15, which Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 17, really relax on this. You get two big teachings from Jesus. Hey, you shouldn't be getting divorces. You Pharisees, you lax the law here, but you shouldn't be. But in real life, people get divorced and remarried is where, we, where Paul picks up on this. So most likely the fifth interpretation that people use is what it's really saying is just being faithful to your wife. In a Greco-Roman society, it was so normal for them to visit prostitutes. It, it just, that's just a normal, like you don't have sex with your wife for pleasure. That's what you get a prostitute for. Your wife is for procreation. And so that's most likely what he's saying is these are the kind of guys that aren't doing that anymore. Temperate. Um, and, and this temperate word here is often used in the outside of the New Testament, talking about being able to be self-controlled when it comes to drinking wine. Again, indulgence was the name of the game in many of these voluntary associations. You should also be sensible, which is one of the four cardinal virtues, prudence, wisdom, justice, fortitude, courage, temperance, sensibility, were the four cardinal virtues during the first century. And so he's picking up on some of these virtues. 
you're to be respectable and you're to be hospitable, but all Christians are supposed to be hospitable, but you especially are to open your home. The inn where you would stay, so like we have hotels now. So when people would travel and come into town, that was an option though in the ancient world, but it was bad news. Like you'd get robbed, you'd get beaten, or you were picking up prostitutes in those spaces. So it's expected that as Christian pilgrims come through town, you should be bringing them into your home and providing for them and keeping them safe. Interestingly, you should be an apt teacher. Now, this is more about capacity to instruct sound doctrine, not eloquence. So people, you'll hear people say, oh, you got to be able to teach well, like, you know, have flowery speech and all that. That's not what he's talking about. You have the ability to teach sound doctrine. You're not supposed to be a drunkard or a bully, but be gentle. And this goes together. These are not separate things. And what most scholars see is an allusion to domestic violence. When daddy drinks too much, daddy hits wife and children. And Paul's saying, you, you can't do that. You, you need to be gentle and not a bully after you get drunk. And also don't get drunk. He already told you don't get drunk. You're not supposed to be quarrelsome. B-Dag says it positively. That's an old lexicon. They say you should be peaceable, not a lover of money, which, of course, being a lover of money is the root of all evil. It makes sense if you're going to be managing the church's distribution. And you're supposed to manage your own house competently when this is a lesser to the greater argument. If you can't manage your own home, you can't then manage the church. So if you can manage your own home, then you might be able to manage your own church. And not a new convert. Because if you're a new convert, the devil might get you. Also, you should have a good reputation among outsiders. Otherwise, the devil might get you. <laughs> what Paul is trying to do here is he's saying the devil is seen as an acting agent trying to snare the overseer. Why? Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So there's this, he's trying to warn them almost as well. Hey, if, if, you're, if you're a new convert, you might get puffed up, conceited, you might be a bad teacher, that's not going to look good to the watching world. Also, if you don't have a good reputation among outsiders, there they are again, those Christians, always doing, name it, right? So he's saying, listen, there's this agent acting, actively trying to take out your overseer. So look out, be on the lookout for that. Any questions over the overseer? We're going to put this all together in the end as we talk about what this means for us today. But anything surprised you? Anything that you hadn't heard before? Anything you thought? You know, any questions on this? Okay. Um, yeah. There's a, there's a lot about like managing the family. Yep. Do we know more about like what would have been seen as good ministry? There's a lot of like, you know, if you talk to like Mark Driscoll, it's like, well, the husband's working, the wife's not. They own their own. Yeah. Yeah. Mark can only yeah. preach. Yeah. Mark. Um, yeah. Sorry, keep going. No, no, keep going. I was just going to say, Mark can only preach post industrial revolution in the West, but keep going. Right. Yeah. So obviously, I do not agree with that as like yeah. management. Um, but yeah, so I guess it would just be very interesting to know more about like what was considered good yeah. of a family. Yeah. Um, not spending your money on wine and prostitutes to the detriment of your family. Um, not bringing shame on your family would be one of the biggest things. So being wise in business, um, being hardworking. You know, there's, it's interesting. There's this Greco-Roman world of just hedonism. Um, and then there's this, like, virtuous world where you see many of the, um, the Stoics are starting to infiltrate and kind of say, no, all that opulence, all that, all that nastiness, that's not really what makes a person a good person. So you actually see some competing values in the society. But the idea of being a, a good potter familius means you're able to pass down to your sons um, a good, a good you know, inheritance. You're able to make a deal to get your daughter married off in such a way that she's going to go into a good home. And the way you're able to do that is by being an honorable man. And so you think about the things that will bring you honor. Now, if you are wealthy and you've got all the money and you're the head patron, no one's going to care that you're getting drunk and at the brothel because you're going to bring bread to the city. But if you are, if you are, and most of our churches were a good cross section of society, um, you would probably have one really wealthy family and then several barely making it families, blue collar, and then several really homeless, really downtrodden, and then slaves. And so that middle group. Uh, it would really be about making sure you can provide for your family, making sure you're not seen as a fool in town, you're not doing things that are going to bring shame upon your family. Um, and so, but when you're talking about these overseers, overwhelmingly, these would be people who had a big enough home to host. 
So now you're talking about wealth. So how you manage your wealth, if you're charitable, if you're um, seen as someone who's trustworthy, you make good business dealings. Everybody knows in town if you're the guy who's shysty, right? You get to be shysty like twice. Um, and then everybody's like, ah, fool me once, shame like, what a, <laughs> I don't know if y'all know, but President Bush is making the rounds on social media right now. Like all his old isms. <laughs> and so he had that one where he's like, fool me once, shame on you. And then he pauses, he's like, can't fool me again. That's like what he's saying. <laughs> you can tell he like freezes, he like doesn't know. So anyways, um, so that, that would be a lot of it. When, when people like Mark Driscoll import Western American upper middle class ideals back into the gospel, um, that's a huge red flag because it just doesn't exist in this world. Like there's no woman who's not working if she's below that level of wealth. Like there's no, there's just, and frankly, that idea of mom staying home is a very white ideal. Um, I talked to so many of my, my minority friends who are like, that's just not even, even if we could, we didn't because we like to work. Like we, and so um, anyways, all that to say, Mark, Mark is on a different level for a whole host of reasons, but a lot of it's going to be managing money. Your, your, your children seek to honor you, and so that means you've done a good job in honoring and raising them. Um, your kid, like that story of the prodigal son who wastes the fortune and comes back, that's wild because what you should do is shun him because he's brought dishonor on the family. You kind of say, mm-hmm. So the fact that dad runs out there undignified and runs to his kid is an example of like the, like, the mercy and the goodness and the love of God. But um, yeah, most of the Christian, there's just like, there was no middle class. So a lot of it is just being a good businessman and, and loving your family. And loving your family means honor, not butterflies. So the question I guess I would ask is, what was the size of this church? Yeah. In Ephesus, um, so... The average room that could hold a gathering in a wealthy home would be able to actually hold anywhere from 80 to 120 if they were super wealthy. And when you're talking about Ephesus, chances are somebody's super wealthy converted. So you might be able to get anywhere from 80 to 120. My guess is, though, because Ephesus was just so difficult for them. Oh, I don't I mean, I would be willing to bet they had anywhere from 20 to 100. That's what I would say. Um, yeah, and, and that, again, that, so, and the way you would plant a new church is you just outgrew the space you were in, and so then some other home would say, okay, we'll take home, so, like, we outgrew Jim's home, so we're up next, and Alex is the mater familias of our home, she's not, but we'll let her be for tonight. Yes. So, I don't know if we did this with you two, but um, we call wives here <laughs> whenever it's time to, to bring on an elder, which I think, you know, we just work so closely with Debbie. I think we just kind of said, hey, do you, do you love your husband? Um, there, there's a real sense of you can find out pretty quick. And that's also part of why we say, look, like, y'all, if there's something about Jim, we won't know. <laughs> we need to know. And so that's the thing is it's going to be a tight knit enough community. Chances are, like, um, we'll talk about when we get to when we get to deacons. That word for tested is more like vetted, and that's kind of that idea of like, is this person who they pretend to be behind closed doors? And you know, when you you'll find that out. It might take time. People can hide, but can't hide forever. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, you guys are going to hop back in your group. Um, which of any of these qualifications were placed at the top of the list in selecting leaders and which are sometimes diminished that you've experienced? So would you, like, which of these would you say, hey, yeah, this was actually at the top? And which ones would you say, honestly, we might have kind of gotten away with a few of this or whatever, or maybe not. Um, and why might it be important? Why might this list, and again, it's not a checklist, but it's sort of like a picture of what an overseer would be. Why is it important when we're selecting church leaders? All right, so hop back in your groups. Uh, if, I, if I spoke to Alex and Robin that way, they would just like laugh in my face. Um, so I just, I just chewed on two Pepto things. And I have to tell you, I take a lot of Pepto, and I, it turns my tongue black. And I spoke at a speaking event once, and I was like, uh-oh. And so like, people were like, what's going on with your mouth? I was like, mm, don't worry about it. That's just a fun fact for y'all. All right. Um, 
I'm specifically interested, did any of y'all have one of those qualifications that was diminished? They, yeah, Karen, you shook your head. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, Raising that in, and, and also controlling your family because it could be kind of interpreted as putting the thumb screws on. And yeah. It doesn't account for the family having their own agency. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that. So I think what's interesting is like. So even Megan, going back to your question too. Not only would the overseer most likely have a wife and children, he, he most likely would have grown children that would also be under his influence and slaves. Um, we don't want that, right? That's like, that, like we don't want that at all. Um, and we have a very, like, if y'all still wielded that type of influence over your grown children today, I would say, ooh, well, yeah, we have a failure to launch situation here. Um, so even that is like controlling your household. Uh, if that results, yeah, like you're talking about, like this domineering sense of, um, yeah, where, where there's no love, there's no peace in this home. It's just fear. He's just he's ruling by a you know fist. Like that's not good. Uh, and hopefully people have enough common sense for that. But unfortunately, I think sometimes people use the Bible as like a checklist, and they're just like. Well, his kid, you know, was drinking behind the school, and we caught them all, and so he's unfit to be an elder. I'm like, kids mess up. That's not, that's not what's happening here. Does, does he have a good relationship with his kid? Does he love his kid? Is he disciplining his kid, right? There's sort of these things. So um, any others that y'all would say were diminished? Any other group have one that you're like, eh? I think those, I think that's, yeah, I think y'all are getting at it. I, I do think there's a lot of quarrelsome leaders. They're not peaceable men. Um, or women, for that matter. And I think social media, we see a lot of that. And I think that's very unhealthy. So, all right, deacons. Uh, the word deacon itself, dekayanos, uh, de, de, de is often used in servant context outside of the Bible. It's more like a helper. So it's like a, it's a servile thing. And so it's an, inter it's an interesting office in the Bible and that they're often, like, people who are named deacons are often seen serving physically, like in Acts, where they're to feed the widows and do the food distribution. So you see this moment where um, the, the widows are having an issue, the Gentile widows and the Jewish widows are feuding, and Peter's like, look, it's getting in the way of us declaring the gospel, so let's just appoint some deacons uh, to do the food distribution. And Phoebe, in Romans 16.1, is called a deacon. Now, depending on your Bible translation, it'll just say she's a servant of Ken Cray. But it's the word. It's the same word for deacon here. Um, and even Calvin, uh, John Calvin said, yeah, of course women were deaconesses, like Phoebe was. And so he just saw it as a, a lesser role within the church, with less authority. And so it can be translated servant. I'm not, you know, that's an option. It's probably not what's happening there. But it's, a, it's an interesting role in that... You're going to notice a lot of the same qualifications um, as we go through, but there's a couple of key missing ones, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So deacons are meant to be worthy of respect, so people respected him for a reason. It's kind of this, like, not, not that he's worthy of respect, but there's something in his character that makes him respectable. It says not double-tongued, or he might have, like, not hypocritical. In other words, what he says is what he means. Uh, he's not a drunkard, so again, kind of that same idea with the temperance, with the overseers. Not a lover of money, so again, same, same idea as before. And also, he doesn't get his money through dishonest gain. Um, he, he can handle the mystery of God, is what it talks about. He's God's plan for salvation. The reason why Paul uses that word mystery to talk about the gospel sometimes is he's saying God's plan of salvation was previously veiled, and now it has been unveiled. And so Paul often talks about the mystery uh, have y'all ever had a pastor that says, my job is to be a steward of the mysteries of God? You three have. And so, yeah, um, it's Todd's tagline. Yeah, and so what he, what he means by that, what Paul means by that is a steward of the mystery of God is it's to be a steward of the gospel. And so this is what the deacons are also supposed to do. And so they're supposed to hold fast to the message of the gospel with a clear conscience. And if you remember chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, it talks about the, the goal of instruction is from a pure heart, a clear conscience, sort of this idea. Like, like, in other words, be who you claim to be 
and allow the gospel to transform you to be a person of virtue continues to be this idea that Paul is churning up toward Timothy. Um, they are supposed to be tested according to your Bible, but that word tested is vetted language in the voluntary associations. So in the same way that we would just say, like, we just, nobody, like, you don't sit on a Sunday and people are like, who wants to be a deacon? And people are like, me. And you're like, cool, one, two, three, we got three deacons, right? That's, Paul's like, no, 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 Timothy, make sure these people, and again, Timothy is an itinerant preacher. He's coming in. We don't know how long he's been in Ephesus when he's getting this letter. So this is wisdom, too, because it's, like, I like, I tend to know a lot of y'all. So in terms of, like, vetting, I'm like, well, I've, I felt pretty good about Jim. Like, I'd spent three years with the man before we asked him to be an elder. Maybe longer, honestly. And so, like, that would be an example of vetting. Like, you've already seen the character in their life. And so you'd say, okay, make sure that, that that's happening. Then it says, wives or women. I don't know if you caught me reading that. The problem with Greek is the same word for wife is the same word for woman. Same for man and husband. It's very annoying. Um, I'm like, really, guys? You couldn't come? Like, also, it makes me think that they just call <laughs> wives women women. Like, I think, like, anybody ever hear a husband call his wife, like, hey, woman? I think that's what they were doing. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> one of my best friends, Nathan Wagnon, he was uh, one of four children, three boys, one girl. And they call the, his sister, I don't know her real name, they just call her woman. <laughs> Like, literally, like, I would hear him go, hey, woman, when you pick up the phone. I always knew he was talking to his sister. And I was like, all right. But I, but I call my brother brother, and he calls me sister, which is like, I mean, we don't use our names very often. So anyway, whatever. Um, he calls my, uh, my mom Maja from anybody? Austin Powers? Okay. <laughs> You're a better person if you don't know that reference. Uh, but so there's this weird thing that's happening here. So some people think, oh, the wives of deacons need to be this way, but a deacon is a lesser role uh, than an overseer, and we didn't say anything about the wives of overseers, and so a lot of scholars think, no, it's talking about the female deacons, and they have slightly different virtues because in this world, women and men had different virtues. Honestly, it's not unlike today. Now, I think that's silly. Like, I think it's silly to say men should be courageous and women should be hospitable, but that's the culture we live in. I think men should be hospitable and women should be courageous and vice versa. But it, it would make sense in this time to say, hey, we're looking for women of noble character. So this is what a woman of noble character looks like. But again, it's very similar qualifications that we've already seen. So she is also to be worthy of respect. People respected her for a reason. She's not a slanderer or double-tongued. She's temperate. There's our virtues again. And she's faithful in all things. And then it goes back to our deacons. So it goes like deacons, either wives or women, and then back to deacons. And it says he's to be faithful to his wife, just like the overseer is, and he's supposed to be a good household manager, just like the overseer. So they're very similar lists, except he goes out of his way to name women among this group or wives, which is why I think because he names the women, I think he's talking about women, because I think it's the same thing happening with Phoebe and elsewhere. And we just have a lot of evidence that women served in the early church. It was just overwhelming that they did. And so I think women were deacons. S's, deaconesses. And so, and he says, look, if you do all of these things, like if you have these qualifications, you will have a good standing. It's actually a military language to say like you'll be promoted in the ranks. And he's saying if you do these things, you'll have a good standing in the community and before Christ. So you can't leave a culture entirely when you're writing. This is honor language as well. He's saying, look, it's, you will have honor if you do these things. Now, is this why we do these things? No, we do them because we want to be committed to Jesus, but the result of being committed to Jesus is you become a person of virtue and a person of honor, and, and that's a really beautiful thing. Um, so conclusions about deacons, deaconesses. Uh, they are the men and women who served in the church, and they did the ministry, the food distribution, uh, probably served the Eucharistic meal. Chances are when someone was sick, you would call an elder and maybe a deacon in addition to an overseer, um, you'll see people, they, so in the second century, Ignatian writes all these letters about church structure. And by the second and third century, there's a lot of hierarchy in our churches. You have, you know, you have bishops, you have elders, you have uh, deacons, you have all these things. And people will read back in that and kind of say, it's an overseer, it's a deacon. They're like the junior Overseer, And then the other problem is they start using the word elder when they mean overseer. So we, we get a whole lot of problems here. I, I don't 
I think the overseer was the head of the household where they met. And the deacons were other very faithful people in the church who did ministry. That's what I think is going on in Ephesus. And you're not going to have a ton of overseers, but every new church is going to have an overseer. And that's going to be a person whose wealth provides for the church. Most likely their wealth is what provided for the Eucharistic meal. Um, and, and because people are very comfortable with the paterfamilias understanding of leadership, then that's the man that's going to be leading that church. I think Lydia was the woman who led her church, and she probably had deacons and deaconesses. Probably that Gentile jailer, maybe that demon-possessed girl. But when we see deacons in the New Testament doing things, they're doing ministry often is what we see them doing. So general conclusions. Uh, They're pretty similar qualifications, but apt teacher and not recent convert are for the overseers. So it seems as if they have some sort of bigger t- can teaching component for the most part. Um, and, but most scholars who really study church structure in the first century say the name itself kind of tells you what the role is. The overseer is the overseer, and the, deacon, and the servant is the servant. The overseer is the one that's managing the finances, caring for the distribution, kind of dotting you know, the I's and crossing the T's, all that. And the deacon is the one washing the feet, giving out the bread, all of that. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, But I also think, so you get the teachings of Jesus. If you only had Jesus, man, we'd be so flat. We'd all be rushing to the back of the line. And then Paul goes out into the Gentile pagan world and says, oh my gosh. Because Jesus is talking to a Jewish context that already has some stability in this family. And so they're already elders. You already have tribe clansmen, you sort of have this understanding. Well, now Paul is going to Philippi, and everything's an honor shame culture. And he's saying, okay, how do we make church work here? And then he goes to Ephesus, how do we make it work here? And then he goes to Corinth, how do we make it work here? How do we, you know, all this stuff. And I think what he learns after the initial planting of the church is you start getting false teachers, and suddenly you're going, now we're vulnerable, and I'm going to leave. And so I think when Paul's there, you have a very Pauline-centric church plant movement. And then he's like, I got to go. Hey, Linnell and Mario, I can't help but notice we've been meeting in your homes. I can't help but notice Mario tends to love the young slave girls really well. He doesn't touch them. He doesn't harm them. Would you two look after the flock? Yeah, great. He's our overseer. She's our deaconess. That's what I think is happening in a very practical sense. Not unlike how missionaries set up churches today when they go over. So it's interesting. Like People who don't want to see women in leadership, they don't have a problem on the mission field. Yeah. Oh, I could tell. True. <laughs> okay. So. That's where you have to go. Yeah. You have to do yeah. Can I ask you a question? Paul? Yeah. Do you think the word overseer in First Timothy and the word overseer in Philippians is the same? Uh, such a good question. Yes, but I'm so hesitant to say that. Um, because what I've read is that overseer in Philippians is more of a teacher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, so in Philippians, you get the sense, so, oh man. Um, Sorry. No, I don't have my phone. Will you toss me your phone? The One of the best books I've ever read on the book of Philippians uh, is something, it's like, oh. Um, Philippians Shared Leadership. It's one of the best books on shared leadership is, is what you're talking about. That Philippians was so consumed with honor and hierarchy that you get the sense, I mean, Philippians too is like, hey man, you want to be at the top? It's a race to the bottom. And you get the sense that when he's telling them, hey, you really, y'all need to really humble yourself. And there is this sense of shared leadership Oh, my goodness. I'm not going to be able to think of it off the top of my head. Um, and people who have studied Philippians, it's more of that. It's exactly that. It's interesting he uses the same word, which is also where, like, the Philippians would have known. Timothy would have known. And that's why we need them to tell us what, what exactly. I'm going to find this book for you all. Uh, it's one of the best books I've ever read on how honor works. And so the first half of the book is all about that. And then the second half of the book is all about showing how it was shared leadership in Philippi overwhelmingly shared leadership in Philippi. Now, 
what you'll hear scholars say is, yeah, Philippi was an earlier letter. These are much later letters. More false teaching has come in, so we need more hierarchy by the time the pastorals come out. That's how people make sense of this more hierarchy. I'm not entirely convinced of it. I think Paul is like, man, Artemis is crazy, and we need some real leadership here, and this is what we've already seen happening here, and I'm going to put these structures in place. Um, but the guy who wrote the Philippians book, everybody in my class hated the book because he goes on and on and on about how beautiful shared leadership is and how it's amazing and how there's no hierarchy in the Bible and all that, and he belongs to a domination that does not have women preach or ordained. And people were like, no. And so I was like, guys, just take his argument. Leave him alone. So, um, yeah, Julie. I mean, given, given that Jesus says I'm the good shepherd, and so you have the, the shepherd analogy, and the overseer does have some kind of overness. Yeah. I mean, could it be more a role of protection against false teachers? 100%. Predators? Yeah. I mean, that's. That's not lording it over someone. That's having a sacrificial sense of responsibility for the weaker people in your midst. In the same way, if you're a slave, you, you're the potter familias, your slave does something in society that kind of messes up, they're not coming to your slave, they're coming to you. Hey, I think that same sense of responsibility would have been true. Let's say Mario's our potter familias for the us. And these three gals, sorry, y'all, are uh, slave girls who belong to someone else, but somehow got wind of Christ and now belong to the church. And they have, but now their owners starting to get a little perturbed because they're starting to share the gospel a little bit more. And they're starting to push back against the fact that he wants to have sex with them. And they're saying, hey, you really shouldn't do this. You, should, you need to meet Jesus. And he's mad. Guess where I bet he goes? Right to Mario's doorstep. And I think Mario would have seen it as his responsibility to say, okay, hey, how can we work this out? How can, how can we make this to where there's peace here, that they can still come and worship? Um, so, yeah, I think that's a lot of what you'd be seeing in that role. Jesus is the shepherd par excellence, right? So you get this sense, too, where um, the shepherding language is something that I'm hesitant. You know, he's like, you know, he's like, why do you call me good? There's no one good but the Father. Like, there seems to be this sense where Jesus is trying to help people understand Psalm 23 is about me. Sort of all these images in the Old Testament are about me. So there's some of that going on. And then I think this is how do you put the gospel on the ground where the world is real and it's really difficult. And I think that's what Paul is trying to contend with, is how do, we, how do we get people to the good shepherd? Some of y'all are going to have to shepherd. What's interesting, there's a ton of 4th century art of women holding shepherd staffs in churches and places where they gather. Don't tell me women didn't shepherd. Um, I, I'm telling y'all, this guy is right on the tip of my head. I'm going to find this book, and I'm going to email all of you, and you're going to have to go buy it, and it's the best book on Philippians I've ever read. It's, I can see the cover. Okay, I'll find it. Y'all are, y'all are getting to why it's so difficult for us to say this is what every church had. Because I really do think it was different in every church. This is what all the scholars who really study this are like, hey, we think it's great that your local Presbyterian church says there was ruling elders and teaching elders, but that didn't exist. Like, that's a completely made-up construct. And they're like, no, this is the biblical model. And they're like, no, it's not. That was, that was much later, no. Um, and so, yeah. Pretty similar qualifications. Again, overseer is an overseer, servant is a servant. Pastor is not a one-to-one of overseer. But a lot of what a pastor would do would be very similar to the overseer. Now, I have this article Departure, Why I Left the Church, written by a guy named Andrew, no, Alexander Lang. This thing went wildly popular. It was all over the internet. And he talks about the great, he's, he left, he left it. He's like, I'm not, I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to be a pastor anymore. And he talks about the great pastor resignation. Did y'all know we're in the middle of the great pastor resignation? Um, Barn has been tracking this since 2020. As of 2022, I'd be curious to see the numbers this year. 42% of pastors considered quitting, and the reasons for this are a myriad, but the top five reasons why pastors want to quit, almost half of your pastors want to quit, 
56% say it's the immense stress of the job. 43% say they feel lonely and isolated. 38% cite current political divisions. And I will just tell you all right now, all my pastor friends are shuddering when they think about 2024. They're like, I can't do it again. We barely survived 16. I don't know how we made it through 2020. I cannot do 24. Um, 29% say I'm unhappy with the effect this role has had on my family. And number five says I'm not optimistic about the future of my church. That's 29%. So over half are like, I am so stressed out that I don't want to do my job. So he talks about the reasons why. He has a 1,000 bosses. I don't think of y'all as my bosses, so <laughs> joke's on y'all. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you got a thousand bosses, you have no bosses, is how I feel. You got a hundred bosses, you got a hundred bosses. So, unrealistic expectations, he cites that. He talks about all the skills that you have to have in order to be a pastor today. And he says, this is what you need to be to be a pastor. You got to be a professional speaker, which is very true. If you're not good at preaching, people will go down the road and they'll let you know. It's like amazing how much feedback you get as a pastor. <laughs> like, it's like one of those jobs. St. Jude is the exception. I, I, I love my job. I love my job. Um, but we're also expected to be a CEO, kind of understand how to run a company, which we hear this language all the time, especially in leadership books for pastors. It's, you, could, you could run a company that way. You've got to be a counselor. You have to be a fundraiser. You have to be an HR director. You have to be a master of ceremonies, and you have to be a pillar of virtue. And you got to do it all by making well under $55,000 a year while you have a wife and most likely three or four kids who she has to homeschool, so you only have one uh, income coming in. And he goes on and on and on. He talks about growth versus fixed mindset, yada, yada. Well, I think it helps, yeah. Um, yeah, you have to do all these things. How many of those things are in this list of overseer? Teaching, teach, app teacher. But, but notice the kind of teacher he was talking about. Yeah, professional speaker. He's not saying sound doctrine. How many of y'all know of pastors who frankly couldn't pass a the theology test, but they are charismatic as all get out? Please don't be thinking of me. Yeah, this is, we, anyways. <laughs> There's been a drift, and I think in a lot of ways, um, we pastors own some of that accountability, um, but I'm going to put the blame back on we consumers of churches. This, this, we have moved far away from this, and that's not healthy. Paul did not say any of those things to the people who were going to be caring for the, the church. After he talks about deacons, then we get to 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16. This is kind of the hinge of the letter, if y'all like the Bible project. There you go. It's right there. They don't call it the hinge, but I just like the Bible project. Um, so this is interesting. His, uh, I wanted to see how they handled the women's stuff from the last one. And so they're like, there's a lot of different ways you could view it. Okay. And then they moved on. I was like, Tim. Tim's egalitarian. So you heard it here first. Um, he goes on, and after he gives these instructions, I want to remind you, first, the first chapter is all these instructions of Timothy. This is what we want to be doing. We want to be teaching out of love and a pure conscience. And then chapter 2, it's like, hey, men, don't be angry. And women, like, what, you know, like, let's have some orderly conduct within our churches. And then we get to chapter 3, and he's like, this is the kind of people you want to put in charge to lead your churches wisely. And he says, and now we get the why, okay? And it's because the church is the dwelling place of the living God. This is why it matters. Not so you'll meet your budgets. Not so the church will grow in size, but not wisdom and stature. Not so that, hey, Tim can get out of here because we've got, I mean, we're just, every year we're looking at our bottom line and we've got to have 10 new churches every year on the Mediterranean coast, right? That's not why. It's because how we conduct ourselves to a watching world is really important. And so after this, he'll give more instructions, like after this hinge, like as we move on, he'll give more instructions on the ministry of widows, elders, etc. But this is the part of a little reminder of why it all matters. As he's given Timothy instructions, it's like, hey, don't forget, this is like why all of this matters. And so the household of God is temple language. We see the same phrase used in the dedication of the temple in First and Second Kings. And so he's saying, look, the church is now the temple of God. That's crazy. So cool. Because what is the temple? 
It's the place where God and man met. And he's saying this is, this is the place where God's spirit dwelled in the world where, where God and man met. And now the church, you all, you all are the temple. And so the living God is also, he says, this is the church of the living God. It's a common Old Testament as a contrast to the dead God of the nations. God talks trash. If y'all haven't heard that yet, go read your Old Testament. He is constantly talking trash. But he's like, those gods. Y'all remember when uh, um, uh, Elijah is like going to battle the prophets of Baal? And he's like, hey, call down fire. And he just starts mocking them. That's better. That's good storytelling. He learned that from God, I think. And then Paul raps about the gospel. So he ta- who's he talking about? Who was manifested in the flesh? Yeah, he's basically giving the gospel. Jesus comes and dwells among us. Did Artemis? Did Zeus? Yeah. And then he's vindicated in the spirit. Vindication is resurrection. This is what they mean when they say he's vindicated. Because he died a criminal's death. So everybody assumes he's guilty. And so the fact that he rises again is his vindication. It's to say, no, he was innocent this whole time. Um, he's seen by the angels. That's most likely a reference to the empty tomb on Easter because the angels are there and they're like, what are you looking for? He's not here. He preached among the nations. We see that all over uh, the book of Acts. He believed uh, in the world. Come through Jesus. The world believes. And then he's taken up on glory. Pretty amazing. Paul rapping. Chances are this is an early church hymn, poem, something that they would say like, um, y'all ever teach like kids the gospel? Like you have the bracelets, you know, like little, like chances are this was like a way that people would would talk about the gospel. All right, we're gonna skip the discussion just because we're running out of time. But we're gonna talk about our so what? Leadership is necessary. It is. Bad leadership though is deadly, and and I mean that. Like, and I'm not trying to be hyperbolic. Like, people really get hurt. Um, You hear stories, sad, sad stories of people who have been really harmed by church leaders. And, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, here in Dallas, I mean, there's a young man who took his life because of what happened at Canacook. This is, a failure of leadership is, is, I don't have to convince you all of this. You have your own stories. But good leadership is life-giving. And so what happens is we kind of go, man, I've been so hurt by church and leadership and all that, so I just want really a flat structure. And in an ideal world, that's great. Um, But in a flat structure, you can just have a couple of people that can really change that whole group. I saw Scott McKnight. He's uh, my professor. I'm getting my doctorate under. And he wrote a book called Tove, which is all about goodness, culture, and the church. And then his follow-up to it is a book called Pivot, which is actually really funny because it's like, P-I-V-O-T, and he wanted it to be like Tov 2 or something like that. And they're like, you can't use Tov again, but P-I-V-O-T-T-O-V. So it says Tov right there. He's like, it says Tov on the book. And I was like, well. <laughs> um, but he was talking to um, Annie Downs was interviewing him, and she was like, is the church still worth it? And he was like, Annie, I don't think we understand the impact of a group on ourselves. He's like, no, if you're in a group that's, gossiping and and toxic and all that like that's going to have an impact on you he's like but if you're a part of a group that's pursuing goodness and and joy and love and mercy and and all of these things he's like that will transform you as well you have to have people that are pushing the group in that direction and there's always going to be forces on any group right like do y'all like y'all know there's always somebody who's the lead of the posse even if it's an unstated and, and that person is going to have a lot of impact. Paul's just owning that and saying, let's get the right people with the right impact in these places. We shouldn't use the Bible as a checklist when it's meant to be a wisdom text ever, not just in these qualifications, but ever. So if you're using the law, if you're going through the Old Testament law and be like, boom, 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 that's not how you're supposed to read the law. We have a class on that. I can teach that to you sometime. Women served in the early church. So today when people are like, they do today too often without pay and with no titles. I believed in the early church, they had titles. I think they were acknowledged. I think they were given responsibilities. I believe that I, we know this. Like We know it's part of why the Romans hated the early churches because they're like, they let women and children and slaves in. So yeah, that's kind of our thing, actually. And so if, if they were serving in the early church and that's how Paul is setting up, Paul, who comes out of an extremely patriarchal Jewish framework, 
has a Damascus Road experience, and he's like, hey, Lydia, will you help me plant a church? That's wild, if not for Jesus changing his life. If Paul's like, yeah, women are in, not to mention Jesus, you know, who had women bankrolling his ministry. Like, think about the humility of that. You are a man in the ancient world. You're also God. And you're walking around, and you're poor, even though you have all the riches of the whole entire universe. And you could have anybody bankroll your ministry, and it's women walking around. I mean, like, can you imagine Jesus? Like, hey, can I have a couple bucks? I'm going to go buy some euros. To, to women. He's not worried about how that looks. But everybody else is like, that guy, he's crazy. And you're like, wait till you hear what he preaches. It's even crazier. We, the consumer, myself included, have made environments where narcissists thrive. We just have to own that. So how do we hold ourselves accountable to desire leaders who are humble, gentle, and kind? This is the result of us wanting more entertainment. I mean, and then finally, we are the temple of God. That is amazing. We should probably have spent 45 minutes just on that, but we got to get through Deacon's Elders. But like, yo, we are the housing place of where God and man be like, this is pretty amazing. Martin had this woman in his ministry that she would go around and she would touch people's faces, which I heard you told Alex you thought I was going to grab your face the other day, which I should have. <laughs> just squeeze your little cheekies. Um, and, and Martin was like, why do you do that? And she's like, because God is in me and I want them to have a counter with God. Now, I ain't touching nobody in today's age. <laughs> <laughs> but when I get a little bit older and a few more gray hairs on my head, I might get away with that. But um, I said a few more gray hairs. Did you like how aspirational that was? Uh, all that to say, like, we can take seriously that God is in us and with us. That's pretty amazing. And so uh, use that. Use your influence. You know, this is about overseers and deacons, and many of you in this room have no aspirations of doing that. Maybe we'll never lead in any capacity. Please do not think you're off the hook. Like, oh my goodness. Martin and I recognize we might be the least influential people in Oak Cliff. We are constantly having to overcome the fact that we're pastors, where y'all just get to slide in those coffee chairs and no big deal. So please do not underestimate the power of God in you to proclaim the gospel with your life, with your behavior, with your words, with your speech, the way you love, the way you give, the way you serve. We have the opportunity to meet people and, and give them God which is what, what the world needs. Any questions from the suite? We just have like five minutes.